Hi, everybody. Uh, this is the next lecture. I think the last lecture was a little bit weird in the sense that we didn't really do any calculations. It just served as a bridge from the Z test to the T test. But now we're really getting into uh, statistics that we're actually going to calculate with numbers. And unlike the one sample Z test, it is a test that we do in real social science. So we are actually now getting into the real stuff, not just the lead-ins to the real stuff. So the first t-test we're going to do, and there's two t-tests. One is called, it's called, again, the terms are to confuse us, I think. It says two independent samples. What does that mean? It means basically we're going to compare two separate groups on some sort of dependent variable. And so Let's say that we did our alcohol study and we had a six drink group and then we had a placebo group that didn't get alcohol but they got maybe fake alcohol but there's no alcohol in it. And those people are separate people so either you're in the six drink group or you're in the placebo group and then we're going to compare those two separate groups to see if they differ on attraction ratings. And so that's what independent samples means. You're comparing two separate groups of people. And just using a term that we had for our research basics, this is called between subjects. Between subjects, just as a reminder, is a fancy way of saying everybody in your study gets just one level of your IV. So they either get the six drinks or they get the placebo condition. They don't get both. And so when you do that, and there's only two groups, two groups of people, they're separate, they're different people. Nobody belongs in more than one group. You're either in the six drink group or the placebo group. The appropriate statistic is independent t-test. Sometimes we just say independent t-test, I will call that. But the long name to confuse you is t-test for two independent samples. Why do they say two independent samples? Because the assumption is that there's two separate groups, the drinks group versus the placebo group, and you're comparing them. And they're independent because the only thing that should differ between those two groups is that level of alcohol, six drinks versus no drinks or no alcohol. Okay, let's continue and actually get into this. So we're actually going to do real numbers this time, and we're going to see how things really work with actual data. So I just talked about it there. So again, between subjects, each person in your study gets just one level of the IV. They either get the six drinks or placebo condition. And that's an independent t-test. Our next lecture is going to deal with a condition on the bottom where you have within subjects design where everybody gets all levels but if it's a t-test it's going to be just two levels because t-test compares just two things and so if you have a within subjects they come in you ask do you drink today they say no you give them the placebo condition and then you see how their attraction ratings are in the placebo condition so you have them rate photos then you give them some drinks, some give them six drinks, let's say. You wait for whatever it is, an hour, for them to drink those things and uh, have the alcohol set in. And then after that sets in, you have them rate other photos. So in that design of within subjects, you're comparing within people whether they get high, give higher scores of attraction when they have six drinks versus no drinks. That, again, is our next lecture. It's called pair t-test. We'll talk about that next lecture. This lecture is independent t-test comparing two separate groups of people. And this is why they call it independent. So, And this is a thing that we need to sort of realize is that this type of design considers that there's two populations. So it's not just one population, say I'm just gonna grab people. The assumption actually is that there's two populations. So I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna talk about it in terms of our example, not the example that's here. So one population 
is a population of people who aren't drinking. So population of not drinking people. And so our sample is our group that we have a placebo condition. So the assumption is that we have one sample that is placebo that represent a population of people who don't drink or who aren't drinking. It's not that they don't ever drink, but they're not drinking. So if you don't have alcohol in your system, what do you act like? So there's that population. Then there's a second population of people who have six drinks in their system. And so our group that is the six drink group is considered a sample of that population of how people would act with six drinks in them. So we are considering that we have two separate samples from two separate populations that we're making conclusions about mathematically. Uh, why is this important? Why am I talking about this? Because it affects our degrees of freedom. So remember our degrees of freedom is n minus one for every sample. So just remember degrees of freedom if there's 40 people. If I know the total score for 39 people and I know the mean for those 40 people for that test, let's say, I know the 40th person's score. So the degrees of freedom is n minus one because that last person I can tell what their score is gonna be based on the sum of the other 39 scores and the mean. So only 39 scores out of the 40 vary are free to vary. One person's score I will know. So again, that degrees of freedom of n minus one is true for every sample. So again, with this design, we have two samples. We have a sample of people who aren't drinking at the moment. How are they gonna act? Their degrees of freedom for that group, so that group of our placebo group has a degrees of freedom of n minus one, the number of people in that group minus one. We also have a separate sample from a separate population of six drinker, six drink group. I hope I didn't flip flop that, but uh, so we have the placebo group, no drinking, and then the six drink group. So the six drink group, they're representing the population of human beings, how they act if they have six drinks. That's a separate sample. So we also have to get the degrees of freedom and minus one from them. How many people are in that group minus one for degrees of freedom? And to get the degrees of freedom for our whole study then is that we have to add those two together. So the degrees of freedom n minus one for the placebo group, the degrees of freedom for the six drink group n minus one, and add those two together to get our degrees of freedom for our study. Again, if, you're, if you didn't quite follow that, we're gonna have actual numbers with two examples later that it will show you in very concrete uh, ways how that's done in terms of degrees of freedom. So we've already talked about this. So we've already talked about the conditions of the independent t-test. It's done when you have a between subjects design and you only have two levels of your IV. So you only have two groups, six drink group versus placebo group. And nobody's in more than one group. You're either six drinks or placebo. And then the other condition is on the top there, which is your dependent variable is at least approximating interval level measurement. And in our study, it is, because we have numbers for attraction, right? And we can say that one through 10, rate the numbers one through 10. So it's interval, there's no true zero. And we're gonna make assumptions that they're equal intervals, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. We don't have to worry about arguing about whether they really are equal or not, whether it's ordinal or interval, that's kind of a philosophical debate. Notice that in bold, it says approximates interval. So when we do our stats, we just say, hey, we don't have to have this big fight about whether they're equal intervals or not. Doesn't matter. We'll just say it approximates it and move on. Let's calculate our stats. So what I just talked about was with an IV. You can also have this with a PV. So let's say that you want to study shyness. You could create two groups. You could measure shyness in any way that you want, but it could be a questionnaire. And then you find the median, and then you say the people above the median are high on shyness, the people who are below the median are low on shyness. And so now you have two groups. So you could do an independent t-test with those two groups. 
But again, as I said earlier in another lecture, uh, I would be cautious about taking such approaches because it doesn't really seem to capture the nature of shyness. There's probably really more of an interval level measurement of some people are really, really shy. Some people are not shy whatsoever. And there's a lot of people in between. There's lots of points in between. So even though you could do this approach with a predictor variable, it seems to me much more artificial because you're pretending that there's two separate different groups when in reality there's more of a continuum across different people with many points on that continuum. So again, comparing two separate groups in this design. And what is this thing saying? Again, statistics tries to complicate things. All it's saying is that we compare, we are, we're, we're curious if there's a difference between the two groups in terms of the means. So all it's saying is on top is that if the null hypothesis is correct, there's no difference between the means. So if you subtracted the mean for the six string group from the mean from the placebo group in terms of attraction ratings, if the null hypothesis is correct, the difference between those two groups would be zero. The HA on the bottom there is actually a two-tailed test, which just says they're not equal. So one group is higher than another, but we don't like that, right? We like the directional hypotheses where we say six drinks is greater than placebo on attraction. Um, so I'm just going over this in some ways because it's in the textbook, but uh, I'm just going to say that the notation here is meant probably to confuse you. The top just says the, the two groups are equal on the dependent variable. The bottom says the two groups are not equal, but they just express it as the difference between the two means. It's just a little bit more complicated, but that's basically what the stat is testing. Is there a difference between the two means? Okay, I don't like this slide, but I have to present it because it's in the textbook. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this actually, and I'm gonna talk about it, but I wanna draw on it. This is not the real formula. I'm gonna give you the real formula later. This really is sort of a mathematical formula. So I don't like this, but I need to present this because it's in the textbook. This part of the formula really doesn't exist. See what I just circled? Why doesn't this exist? Because if the HO is true, the difference between these two means would be zero. So again, if the HO is true, the difference between these two means would be zero. And given that, this part of the formula really doesn't exist. Also, we don't know what the population mean is. So this is just another effort by textbook writers and, and teachers of math and statistics to confuse you. The formula is just this. And we had this in the last lecture. The formula is just simply, what's the difference between two means? So for group number one, their mean minus the mean for group number two over the standard error. What's the standard error? So remember the standard error, and this says the standard error between the difference between two means. So that's what that just means. I'm okay if you just write SC, that's fine with me, but really officially what it is, it's the standard error in terms of the difference between these two means. But it's still standard error, nonetheless. So the standard error is, Conceptually, we're going to get into the formula in a second. Conceptually, remember, standard error was this little thing we had talked about previously. So remember, standard error was the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So that's the t-test formula that we had been talking about in the last lecture. So this slide is a little bit confusing. I just wanted to unconfuse people because it is in a textbook. The only little caveat that we're going to do, we're going to look at the formulas later, so I don't want to put the full formula up here because we have it later, is we have two, we have two groups or we have two samples. 
So remember, we're comparing two groups. We have, for example, like a six drink group and a placebo group. So we have two groups. We, so we actually have to do this twice. So this whole thing about standard deviation divided by the square root of n, we have to do that for each group because each group has a standard deviation and each group has a sample size n. So this thing is the same thing. So again, this concept is really easy. It's the square root, or I'm sorry, this is the s standard deviation over the square root of n. That's what it is conceptually. The formula for this for the independent t-test will look a little bit confusing because we have to do this twice. So we have to do this twice and then add them together for the two groups. So we would add this together for the two groups. But this thing is the same. This concept is the same for two groups. It's just that it's going to be like you have double vision. You're going to have twice the amount of syllables, syllables, twice the amount of symbols but they are saying this exact thing that we've been talking about for a while since the one sample z. Standard deviation divided by the square root of n, that's the standard error. It's just that we have to do this twice. We have to do this thing for each of the groups, each of the two groups, then we're going to add that together for the two groups. So I'm trying to demystify the formulas. So again, this, this part of the formula doesn't really exist. It's really the difference between two means group number one minus group number two over the standard error. Again, the standard error is standard deviation over square root of n. We just have to do that twice because we have two groups. We have group number one, group number two. We just have to do that twice and then add that together. So I'm going to cancel this. I just get rid of this because I might need that later. So I'm paranoid. I'm always checking that this thing is running. My fear is that it will go off and it won't tell me and then I'm just babbling for an hour and then nothing will record. So remember I said there's a formula for the standard error and all we're doing is we're, we're repeating standard deviation divided by the square root of n twice. This is what does the same. So for our standard error, when we're looking at a difference between two means, that's what it's saying is we have to do that twice. We have to take the standard deviation divided by the square root of n twice. Well, why doesn't say, why didn't say square root here? Well, we have two groups, so we throw the square root across both groups. So there's no square here anymore, square root. But because we do that, we take the square root, we have to actually square our standard deviation. So remember the old standard error form formula was the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. We have two groups. We're going to throw both of the groups under the square root. So we don't have a square root on the bottom anymore, but what that means is that we have to square our standard deviation. This is actually the variance now. So the squared standard deviation or variance of group number one divided by number of people in group number one. You find the variance, so square the standard deviation for group number two divided by the number of people in group number two. You add that together, those two things. Then you take the square root of those things. That gives you the bottom part of the formula, the standard error. And again, we're going to have actual data, uh, two examples that we'll run through, and it will illustrate that a little bit more. So I know that you might be looking at formulas and you feel confused, but it'll be a lot less confusing when we work through some numbers. This slide is a slide that I need to explain to you because you need to know this concept, but you don't need to do this in this class. So basically, the formula I showed you right here, this applies when the sample sizes are equal between the two groups. So this applies to the situation when you have equal numbers of people in each of the two groups. And so what I'll say is that for all of our examples in class, all the examples in the lecture, all the stuff that's in the homework, all the stuff that will be on the exam, we're going to have equal sample sizes in each of our two groups. So you can use this formula. Again, I'm going to tell you about this because you need to know this. 
So this formula, which is called pooled variance, you use this formula for the calculations of the variance that you're going to plug into here. when your sample sizes are not equal between the two groups. So once again, use this when the sample sizes are equal between the two groups. And in everything in this class, we're going to have equal sample sizes. You can use this formula. But how, however, just know that if the sample sizes are different between the two groups, you need to do something special called pooled variance you have to calculate the pooled variance, which is just basically averaging your variance across the two groups, waiting for the sample size. That's what you're doing with this. Again, you don't need to know how to do this in this class. I'm not going to force you to do the calculations because, in my opinion, the extra time and effort to learn and to do these calculations for pooled variance does not help you learn the material any. It's just extra busy work, in my opinion. But you need to know that this thing exists because people will walk around and they will talk about pooled variance. So I want you to understand what it is, even though we're not doing it in this class. Because again, the learning that you get from the extra effort is nothing. The concept is this. The concept is the standard error is the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And then when you have two groups, you have to do it twice. For each group, you have that same ratio, standard deviation divided by square root of n. So you have to do it twice, add it together for independent t-test. Again, pooled variance is only when your sample sizes are unequal. I want you to know that this exists but you don't need to do it. It's a lot of extra work. Computers can do this. Um, just, just know that this exists. So hopefully that's clear. So we just talked about this. This is a standard error. So the standard error is, oh, this is, this is what you do with the pooled variance. So you have, to, you have to do this first. You have to calculate the pooled variance, and then you have to do the standard error. So there's extra calculations. So when the sample sizes are unequal, you just do an average, a weighted average for the, for the variance called pooled variance, and you just stick it in this formula. And you notice that formula is essentially the same as this. So why bother learning extra formulas and doing a lot of extra work doing this extra step when you don't actually learn anything from doing it? But again, you need to know about that devil. You need to know it exists because people will talk about it but you need, don't need to do it in terms of calculations in this class. The final sort of bit of calculations that we need to know is how do we calculate our degrees of freedom? So I talked about this already. I already talked about that we basically have two populations, and we take a sample from each of those populations. So we have a population of people not drinking. What's their attraction like? Well, our sample of the placebo group is from that population. And that sample is going to have a degrees of freedom of n minus 1. However many people are in that group, minus 1 is that degrees of freedom for placebo. Then we have a population of six drink people. So what do people with six drinks in their belly act like in terms of attraction as a population? Well, we take a sample of that. So our group where we give six drinks to the people and measure their attraction levels, that's a sample of that population. That sample also has a degrees of freedom of n minus 1. How many people are in that group? Minus 1, that's the degrees of freedom for that group. So two groups, two samples, two degrees of freedom. We add those two degrees of freedom together to get the degrees of freedom for the full independent samples t-test. And again, we will go through numbers and actually do this with actual data. So if this doesn't click quite yet, it will click when we do that, I think. And speaking of which, and I think, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of like, okay, great, now we have numbers. Now we're actually going to do something. So this will be very concrete ways of demonstrating what we've been talking about. So let's start with our good old beer goggles hypothesis. 
And let's just say we only have two groups because remember t-test, we only compare two things. And with an independent t-test, we're comparing two separate groups of people. So let's say our levels are placebo. So there's fake alcohol, so no actual alcohol. And we, hopefully it passes as alcohol. So people think they're drinking alcohol, but there's nothing in it. And then we will have a six shots group. So another group of people we will bring in, or people, individual people, we probably don't run them together. We run them as individual. Uh, for half of our participants, they'll get six shots. So either the person gets six shots or they get fake alcohol, placebo. And we're going to compare those two groups, comparing them on their ratings of attractive attraction to the photos. So attractiveness of the photos or their attraction to the photos, same thing. Or to the people in the photos. I think it's a little bit maybe weird if you say attraction to the photos, to the people in the photos. And so here's our data. So we have a placebo group. Let's say that their mean is 6.7. Their standard deviation is 1.5. Again, this mean of standard deviation is about their attraction ratings. And then we have a sample size of 20. And so our six shots group, which is going to be our treatment group, so we think that alcohol changes behavior, that's our treatment group. The six shots group has a mean of 6.9, standard deviation of 1.7, and the sample size is for each of the groups, the N, the number of people in each of the groups is 20. And so I'm going to take you through the process of doing an independent t-test with these data. And I'm going to take you through the whole process of hypothesis testing. So there's those five steps we're supposed to do. I'm going to take you through those steps. Oh, I have it here. So table B2 is the t-test table in your textbook if you want to use that. Or you can use this table, which I cited in the last lecture, I believe. I'm going to save that, this table, right here. That's what it looks like when it's close up. This table, the t-test table. So you're free to use this one for free online. And so I'm going to take you through this process. Oh, I'm saving it, so I have to wait a little bit because there's some pictures here. Oh, there we go. So step number one. Remember, step number one is state our hypotheses. We have two types of hypotheses. We have the alternative hypothesis and the null. The alternative hypothesis is why we're doing the study. So if we think that there's beer goggles, we're doing the study because we think that alcohol increases attraction. And so notice that our hypothesis here is stated specifically according to our groups. So specifically, it doesn't say alcohol greater than placebo, it says six shots. That's what we're doing in our study. So six shots is greater than the placebo group on what? On attraction. So you can write this if you want, but this is the pithiest, the simplest way of writing a hypothesis. The six shots group greater than the placebo group on what? On the DV of attraction. The HO, the null hypothesis, is the one that says there's no effect. Oops, and I see I made a mistake. That's pretty bad. I think I copied the two. And it just didn't change it. So no effect means that the two groups are equal. The six shots group is going to be equal to the placebo group on their attraction ratings. Step number one, that's what we did. Step number two, remember, we're always going to have an alpha of 0 0.05. So remember that the alpha is... the percent of us making a type 1 error where we say there's some effect, but there really isn't one. And we know this because we know that our, we have distributions like this. And this can be a T distribution. Remember, the T distribution has kind of the same shape as a, as a Z. So it doesn't really matter whether it's a Z or a T. doesn't matter. Because there's just going to be this little area here where 5% of the scores are. So remember our old Z tables, and it will say that 5% of the scores are here because most of the scores are in the middle and there's fewer on the extremes. And so 
what we're saying is that our placebo group is here. Our treatment group better have a mean over here in this area where there's less than a 5% chance just by luck that they would be there. It's an unlikely possibility. So given that there's an unlikely possibility, there's only a 5% luck chance that you would have a mean so high over there above the placebo mean, then we have kind of a 95% confidence that something's actually going on. So there's actually probably something going on because it's not likely to get a mean that high. That's what our alpha is, is that 5% chance. And the difference here is now with the one sample Z, because it was the Z, the perfect world of a perfect normal curve, which is always 1.645, we didn't have to look that up. We looked it up once. That's it. The t-test, remember, the t-test, it changes. The critical value changes with the sample size, the number of pieces of information that we make our estimates on, so the degrees of freedom, because that's sample size minus 1. And again, remember from the last lecture, the larger your sample size, the closer it is to the mean. You're kind of not that far to the right. And I think I'm going to draw this. So if you have a, this is the perfect world of a, of a Z. So this one's always going to be, I'm going to maybe make this a little bit bigger because I want some space to work on this. So maybe not a perfect representation, but let's just say there's 5% here. Just give me a little bit more space to, to work. So for the Z, you have to cross this line, which is not so hard, perhaps. Still unlikely, but not maybe not as hard. But with a T, because of two things. One is we don't have a perfect normal curve. We have to say, well, we're not living in a perfect normal curve. So we need to be a bit more conservative. We have to go a little bit farther than the Z. The Z is here. So we have to go farther than the Z. So the Z is here. So for the T, we have to go a little bit further. And maybe this is with a sample size of 100. We just have to go a little bit to the right. It's a little bit further, but not super further. But if we only have like a sample size of 10, sorry about that. Let's say our sample size is 10. We have to even go even further because we have fewer pieces of information. So the critical T is going to have to be higher for fewer pieces of information because fewer pieces of information, we're not sure. We're not as confident. So our, our mean for our treatment better be even further away for us to say, yes, something's actually going there, even though we only have 10 pieces of information going on, or nine in this case. Um, and so our critical T has to increase as our sample size decreases. So as the sample size decreases, the critical T increases. So that's what our table's for. Our table is to actually help us know exactly what that line is that we have to cross for our T. Because if we calculate, just like the one sample Z, if we calculate a number that's greater than the critical value from the table, then we reject the HO. If the thing that we calculate from our formulas in terms of our t here, if it's lower than the critical value, then we haven't crossed the line. We're too close to the mean of the placebo group. So we can't say there's a difference. We can't say there's an effect of the IV. And so this is what we're doing here. And I'm going to go into this a little bit more. OK, so remember our degrees of freedom. So we have two groups. Each group has a degrees of freedom of n minus 1. So every sample, every group has n minus 1. So remember, we said there's 20 people in each group. So there's n equals 20. That's for each group. So group number 1, degrees of freedom is 20 minus 1. Then we have to add group number 2 is degrees of freedom, which is also 20 minus 1. So then we have 19 plus 19. So our degrees of freedom for the study is 38. So now we know our degrees of freedom. We can find our critical value for the T. So remember, 
we're going to stick with the one tail test. So we're going to stick with this line. And this is our alpha. Our alpha is 0 0.05. Remember 0 0.05, there's a 5% chance of a type 1 error. There's only a 5% chance you would have a mean for their treatment group that would be so far from the placebo group that it, there's only a 5% luck you would get a mean so high. So therefore, we're 95% sure there's an effect of our IV of alcohol. So we use this column right here, this one right here. And remember, our degrees of freedom was 38. So we have to go down. I'm going to have to do it like this. I have to go down even further. Sorry about that. Yeah, so I hope that you can see this. And I think I'm going to maybe snip this because I'm starting to fear that you might not see that very well. And I'm going to just take that little column that we need. And I'm going to expand it. And by the way, while we're here, uh, never mind. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's actually here. But forget that. I'm, I'm not going to get into that. I don't want to complicate things. So remember, we're going to do the one tail. So the nice thing is I can circle. One tail, and we're going to use the alpha. So this is our alpha. We can live with a 5% chance of making a type 1 error. So that's our alpha that we set. So now all we have to do is go down that column to 38. So let's do that. Notice we don't have 38. We have 40 here. And then we have 30. Use 30. So the rule is if your degrees of freedom is not on the table, use the next lowest. Why next lowest? Because remember that it's easier to find something with more degrees of freedom. So you don't want to go to the higher one because it's more likely to make a type 1 error because you've just decreased the critical value for the T. So if you just notice, and I'll, I'll zoom this, our critical values for the T go down with our degrees of freedom go up. So the degrees of freedom are going up, right? As we go down here, higher degrees of freedom. If we look at the critical T, the critical T shrinks as we get more degrees of freedom, as we get more pieces of information to make our estimates about. So we don't want to go to the next highest one because that next highest one is going to have a lower critical value, it's going to have a line that's actually closer to the mean of the placebo group to the middle than it should be. And that increases our possibility of making a type 1 error, saying there's something going on, there's an effect when there really isn't one. We don't want that. We, want, we need to be conservative in statistics. So we go to the next lowest, which is 30 in this case, 40 and 30, 38. So we go to 30. So we go down here. This is our number. I think I'm going to expand that. See, see what I've done? So this line, this column, alpha 0 0.05, use that one, fine. In this case, 30 degrees of freedom is that number. I'll show you what the number is. Hope you can see it. It's 1.697. We are going to round our T's all our statistics to the second decimal place. So I'm going to round this up to 1.70. So our critical T is 1.70. I think I'm going to draw this <clears throat> yet again. Oh, this one I can close, 1.70. So this is our T distribution. And so shaped like this, da da da. And we have an alpha 0 0.05. That doesn't change. So this, this little area here is still 5%. There's 5% of the T scores there. <clears throat> but this line is T is equal to 1.70. So if the T we calculated is greater than 1.70, we'll be over here. 
and we're going to be far enough away from the placebo group mean to say that alcohol had an effect. However, if we get a T that's lower than 1.70, it's too close to the placebo group mean to say that there's an effect. So then we would fail to reject the HO. There's nothing going on. It's too close to the placebo group. We don't have enough evidence that the alcohol has an effect. So that's what that critical T is telling us. So again, the number that we calculate in our statistic, if that number for the T is greater than 1.70, we reject the HO because it's far enough the way to say that there is an effect of the alcohol. However, if the T we calculate is lower than the critical value, then we say that there is no effect for the alcohol, at least no evidence of that. Because the mean is too close, the mean of the treatment group is too close to the placebo group. It doesn't look like it's big enough to say there's a difference. So that's what the critical value is for. So step number three in hypothesis testing is we calculate our statistics. So here is the formula. <coughs> So the T formula is just simply the difference between the two means. So the mean for group number one minus the mean for group number two. We don't know how big that difference is unless we compare it to something. The something is the standard error, which again is conceptually the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. That's the standard error. But we have two groups, so look on the right. The right formula is for the standard error, so that bottom part of the T formula on the left, that's how we calculate on the right. On the right, we have to find the standard deviation for group number one. We square that. That's the variance. Divide that by the number of people in group number one. And then it's not like that we're doing anything different. We're just doing the same thing for group number two. We're going to take the standard deviation. We're going to square that for group number two. We're going to divide it by the number of people in group number two. So although this looks complicated, there's you know a bunch of symbols there, we're just doing the same thing twice. We're just doing the standard deviation, or I should say variance, because standard deviation squared divided by n for the two groups, and we add that together. And then we have to take the square root. Don't, don't forget the square root. So we used to have the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. We have two groups, so we throw the square root over everything, and we just have to square the standard deviation on top. That's the only difference. So, again, this might look complicated, but just like everything in our stats class is, it's just like a recipe. Just go step by step, and this is what I'm going to show you. I'm going to do the bottom part first. <clears throat> so this is a complicated thing here of having to do this, so let's just do that one first. It's not really complicated. It's just putting the pieces together. So I'm just going to take the data. So remember, right here, look right here. So standard deviation for the six shots group. And by the way, in this whole thing, group number one, I'm going to put as the six shots. And group number two, I'm going to put as the placebo. Well, why am I doing that? Because that's the direction of my hypothesis. My hypothesis is that the six shot group should be higher than the placebo group. So I like to put it in that direction for the t-test because <clears throat> the t-test will be positive if my HA, my alternative hypothesis, is true. I like to do it that way. I like to have the group that I think is going to be higher first as group number one, the one that's lower as group number two because I'll come up with a positive t-test. I like doing it that way. It just makes it simpler to interpret things. However, if you flip it, it won't make a difference, except you're going to end up with a negative T if your alternative hypothesis is correct. So I think there's just a little bit more work to sort of say negative is positive. Negative is a good thing for my HA, so I don't really like that. I just like to keep it in the direction. So group number one in my numbers is the six shots. Group number two is the placebo. So here's our numbers. The six shots group has a standard deviation of 1.7. Remember, there's 20 people. And then the placebo group has 1.5 as a standard deviation and 20 as a sample size also for them. So I'm going to plug those numbers in there. So I have my formulas. 
So the standard deviation for group number one is 1.7. There's 20 people there. Don't forget to square it. The standard deviation for group number two is 1.5. Don't forget to square that. Divide that by 20, number of people in that group. So remember your order of operations. Order of operations, square the things first. So square 1.7, that's 2.89. Square 1.5, that's 2.25. Order of operations, divide these things first before adding them. 289 divided by 20 is 0.1445. 2.25 divided by 20 is 0.1125. Now we have those two things, order of operations, add these together. So add those two together is 2.5, I'm sorry, 0.257. Take the square root of that number, you're going to end up with 0 0.507. So our standard error is 0 0.507. So hopefully, even though it might look like, oh, it's complicated, it's just doing all your steps. Just put in the standard deviation for the six shot group. Put the standard deviation for the placebo group. Number of people in the six shot. Number of people in the uh, placebo group. Then it's just order of operations, square first, square first. Divide these two, divide these two. Get those numbers when you do that. Add these two numbers together. Those two numbers together add to this. Take the square root of that number, and you end up with this. So it's relatively simple if we just take it step by step. So now we have the denominator. The denominator, the lower part of our t-test formula, is going to be 0 0.507. So all we need to do now is just plug in the other numbers. So remember, the t-test formula is the mean of the six shots group. I want the higher group in terms of my HA to be first, minus the mean of the placebo group. So I have six shots there, placebo group. Then the standard error, which we already know is 0 0.507, because we calculated that. If you go back to the raw data here, the mean of the six shot group was 6.9 right here. The mean for the placebo group was 6.7. So we just plug those in. Mean for six shots, mean for placebo. Plug it in, subtract those two. So we're curious about whether those two groups differ. So the difference is 0.2, and then we have to divide it by the standard error, which we calculated in the previous slide. So 0.2 divided by 0.507, sorry about that, is 0 0.40. So again, round to the second decimal place for your final number for the T. So our T is 0 0.40. And on your test, it would be nice if you circle the final answer like this. That would be fabulous. So now we did everything for the calculation. That's step three. T is 0 0.40. So the fourth step is that we now have to make a decision about our HO, our null hypothesis. So I put it in the order of here's my calculated number, 0 0.40. Remember, the critical value was 1.70. Well, 0 0.40 is less than 1.70. So we fail to reject the HO. So there's no evidence of an effect here. So again, if what we calculated is less than the critical value, we fail to reject the HO, which means there's no effect, at least no evidence of an effect. So it's 0 0.40. So remember, our line was 1.70. So a T of 0 0.40 is probably like here, I'm guessing. So what we found was a 0 0.40. So it's not very far from the placebo group mean. So this little, even though we're greater than, even though there is a higher number in terms of the mean, in terms of attraction, it's not far enough to say that that's unlikely. It's it's very likely due to chance. There's a lot. Of, there's still a lot of numbers here. There's a lot of people around here, so it could just be definitely due to random chance to have just a slightly bigger number for our treatment group. So we're over here. We didn't cross this line. So we failed to reject the HO. There's no evidence of an effect. We're not, we don't have a big difference 
here <clears throat> between our two groups. And so then we write it up, step number five. So the main sentence is the everyday language. The main sentence is the six shots group did not differ from the placebo group, and I made a mistake on attraction, attraction ratings. And I caught that. Because the thing, I wrote it a little bit differently for another example. So. <clears throat> so this main sentence again is the six shots group did not differ from the placebo group on attraction ratings. So remember that sort of everyday language thing is we have two things. Say what your two groups are. There's a six shots group and a placebo group. Well, say what your DV is. So what did you compare those two groups on? Well, I compared them on attraction ratings. Then the question is, did they differ? Well, here they did not differ. So state your two groups, six shots, placebo, State what you're comparing them on in terms of the DV, attraction ratings, and state whether they differ or not. Well, in this case, they did not differ. And then we just put in parentheses, for each group, we want to give their mean and standard deviation. So this is the mean for the six-shot group. Whoops. And this is the standard deviation for them. This is the mean for the placebo group. This is the mean for... I'm um, sorry, the standard deviation for the placebo group. So for each group, give the descriptives of mean and standard deviation. This group means standard deviation, but put them in parentheses. Parentheses is just a little details if people want them, but still there's a sentence there. The sentence is still six shots group did not differ from placebo group on attraction ratings. And then the final part is we give our numbers. So little comma <coughs> tells the reader, here comes the stats. So we say what our stat is. Our stat was a t-test. You notice that there's a parentheses right there. There's no space here. In the parentheses is our degrees of freedom. So our reader will see what our stat was based on in terms of the number of pieces of information. Number of pieces of information, degrees of freedom was 38 for this study, or for the statistic, I should say. You might have studies that have uh, multiple t-tests in it, for example. Then we just say equals. This is the number we calculated. The number we calculated was 0 0.40. Then the final thing that we do here in this sentence is we have another comma. We give the result of our null hypothesis decision. So if we say N, <clears throat> if we say NS, NS means not significant. What does that mean? That means there's no difference between my groups. There's no effect of the IV of alcohol. So that's a good example of how the write-up should be for an independent t-test. And this basic structure is the same structure we're going to be using for all of our other statistics in the course. And so, let's do another example, but I want you to work this out on your own, and then I will run through the answers. So let's say we have a study, and this all this stuff is actually based on studies that have actually been done, uh, although I, I tend to do a lot of attraction studies because I think they might be kind of interesting in general to people. Um, so uh, there's a theory called misattribution of arousal, and it basically says that um, in terms of any emotion, uh, emotion is based on uh, physiological arousal in general, and the idea is that your physiological arousal is the same regardless of the emotion you're feeling. So whether you're scared or in love or angry or sad, your body is reacting in the same way. Your heart rate goes up, your pupils dilate, your blood pressure goes up. Um, so the, the physiological arousal is the same. Uh, the difference is the psychological label you put on your emotion. So the, this theory of emotion is that emotion comes from uh, having a high physiological arousal, and what emotion you're actually feeling depends on how you label it, label that arousal. And so misattribution of arousal is essentially for attraction is that 
there's a theory of attraction that if you are in a situation and you are physiologically aroused by something in the environment, your heart rate's going up, your pupils are dilating, your blood pressure's going up, you're like breathing heavy. Uh, and then you look around in an environment and if you see somebody attractive, you go, oh my gosh, they're unbelievably cute or attractive or great. Um, so you have that arousal first and then you look in your environment for a cue about why are you acting that way? Why is your heart, rating, heart, heart racing now? So that's this, this theory. So people have taken this theory, and they've actually done uh, – the initial study was a, a real-life study, which had a lot of flaws in it. But then people took it into the laboratory. Um, and so basically what they do is they have people do something that is um, physiologically arousing. Uh, and the uh, study that I think that this has done, I don't know, don't know if they've done adrenaline. Sometimes they do adrenaline. So sometimes they shoot you with adrenaline or they shoot you with a saline solution. And so the adrenaline makes your physiological stuff be aroused and the saline has no effect on you. Um, and then they give you some sort of stimuli. So they might show a, a person to you that uh, you could meet if you want to. And uh, so the idea is that if you had the adrenaline, you'd be more likely to be attracted to the person than under the conditions of the saline solution because you're feeling aroused. You're looking around the environment for why you're aroused and if there's somebody there that you might meet, you might say, oh, they're really, really attractive. They've also done things like exercising. So I think another manipulation they've done is uh, they had one group uh, do an exercise for whatever it is for like, you don't want to have people keel over, but maybe exercise for two or three minutes. Maybe for most Americans, that's that will get your heart rate going. Um, so do like a running in place or, or jumping jacks or something for two or three minutes. And then they let the person sort of relax a little bit, but of course you still want them aroused. You still want their heart racing. And then the other group is they might watch a boring video, so their their arousal level is low. And then they'll do the same thing. They'll they'll either show pictures and they'll rate the attraction of the person, or they might show uh, a fake video dating thing, like um, here's a person and you you know you signed up for this possibility of a video date in this experiment. And, and, you know, you can meet this person if you want to. So they show the video and then have the person rate the attraction of the person and how much they want to date them, um, how likely they would uh, go out with them uh, if they were asked, things like that, measures like that of attraction. And so, again, the theory is that if you did the jumping jacks or the running in place, uh, you're going to be more physiologically aroused. And then when you get a, a cue from the environment, uh, a person that you might possibly date, you're gonna actually think they're more attractive because your heart's racing, and your heart's racing. You're going, why? Am, what's going on? Basically, it says unconsciously. You're thinking, why am I? Why is my heart racing? Oh wow, look at that person. They they are really attractive. I guess my heart's racing. And if your heart's not racing, you might say, yeah, they're not too bad, but not that great either. Um, so that's the idea. Is it's called misattribution of arousal, which is kind of interesting. So. Uh, the next time you're at a party or a bar or another arousing place and there's uh, music playing and you're with friends and you're, you know, you're feeling happy and then you might fall in love with somebody or in lust with somebody uh, who's there and you find out that's a horrible mistake later on, you might be doing misattribution of arousal because there is evidence for this. How strong it is, I don't know, but there is some evidence for this. Uh, just to sort of also let you know, you might think now, like, huh, there's this person who I really like. I have a crush on them. Why don't I do something that gets them physiologically aroused and they'll like me better? Like, maybe you'll take them to um, a place. I won't advertise any place. Uh, like, not Sperry Farm. I'll advertise. Um, take them to a place that you can go on a bunch of roller coasters. And you think, oh, if I take them on the roller coasters, I'm there. They're going to be aroused from the roller coaster, and they're going to fall in love with me. Um, be careful, because it cuts both ways. Um, so if you're if you're slightly attracted to somebody, the evidence is that maybe this stuff helps you become more attracted to them. But the evidence is also there that if you find them unattractive, arousal is going to make you find them even more unattractive. <laughs> so if your crush doesn't find you physically attractive and you get them physiologically aroused, you're going to just shoot yourself in the foot. 
because they're going to find you even more unattractive if they initially thought that. So I would be I'd be careful about trying to manipulate these things. Just deal with people honestly rather than trying to manipulate them. Okay, a little bit of re uh, regression, but shows you some stuff with research. And this is what that this is based on that research. The numbers are made up, but this is based on that research. And so our DV obviously is ratings of attraction. We'll just do ratings of attraction so they'll maybe see some photos. Or maybe we'll see somebody on video and they'll write their attraction. It doesn't really matter. And then there's two groups. One group is going to be aroused. And then the other group is not going to be aroused. So high physiological arousal, low physiological arousal. So I'm just going to call them aroused and not aroused as the groups. And here's their means, standard deviations, and their sample sizes. Notice their sample sizes are the same, 30. So take these data and go through the five steps of hypothesis testing and test these data to see if these groups differ, see if there is an effect of arousal on attraction. Okay, you should have done this yourself. Uh, so if you haven't done it, do pause and do this first before going on. But here is the answer. So first step in hypothesis testing, we want to state the HA and the HO. So state the alternative hypothesis and state the null hypothesis. Alternative hypothesis, that's our idea. That our idea is that the aroused group is going to be higher than the not aroused group in terms of attraction. Our null hypothesis that there's no effect, there's no difference, is the aroused group is equal to the not aroused group in terms of attraction. Step number two, we always are going to have that alpha 0 0.05. So we're always going to have this situation where for our T test, or for any test, but this is a T. So this is our T distribution, roughly. So only 5% of the T scores are this high. So there's only 5% there. And again, we have the not aroused group is over here. And we're essentially asking, where is our treatment group? So the aroused group. How far is their mean? Is If their mean is over here in terms of the t-test, the t-test will test this. If the t is over here, it means that there's no difference between the groups. If the t crosses this, this line, then there's a difference. That's our critical value line. And a critical value comes from our table. So remember that we have to figure out the degrees of freedom. There's two groups. So we have two groups. We have two degrees of freedom we have to add together. So we have one group. Well, not both groups have 30. but So the first group has 30. 30 minus 1 is that degrees of freedom. Group number 2, 30 minus 1. So we have 29 plus 29. So we have 58 degrees of freedom. We have to go to our t-test table. And I think I'm going to highlight this. I'm sort of regretting now because I wanted to keep this, but I'll, I'll get rid of it. I can do that again pretty quickly. So here's our column, correct? One tail, 0 0.05. And I don't, know if, I don't know how big I can make it. Not very big. I don't even think I can make it that big. Barely. So we have our one tail. So we have want the top line. And we want the 0.05, that's our alpha, right there. And all we have to find is our degrees of freedom now, which was 58. We go down here, we see there's 60. We can't use 60, which is probably good because I can't write on that. So we can't use 60 because that's too high. We have to go to the next lowest. The next lowest is 40. So we have to use 40, and it's this number right here. That's 1.684. Remember, we round, so it's okay to round. Well, we should actually round up. It should be 1.69. Let me look at that. Yeah, it should be 1.69. I should change this. 1.69. So 1.69 is our critical value because we have to use 40. That's the next one, Lewis. And why am I rounding down? 
because remember we want to be conservative. We don't want to push the line this direction. We don't want to push the line closer to the mean of the placebo. We want the line to be further away. So I'm going to round it up to 1.69. So if you made a mistake on that, that's no big deal. Uh, that's what we're going to do. I'm going to change this because I know that this is wrong. So 1.69 is our critical value. Let me double check that. 1.69 doesn't change, even if I look many times. And so let's go back. So our critical value is 1.69. So I'm just going to recall what we just did before that I had to close. Yes, here's our T distribution. And we're looking for that 5% area right here. There's only 5% of the T scores over here. So this is our, our alpha 0 0.05. And the T, the critical T, that line we have to cross is... 1.69, just double checking, 1.69. So if the T that we calculate is above, that's a T, sorry about that, is above 1.69, we're over here. We're in this area on the right. So we're far away from the not aroused group. If our T is over here in this side, we're too close, our mean of our aroused group is too close, and there's no difference between the two groups. So that's our line, that's our critical value. So here's our formulas again. We reviewed that in the first example. So I think it's better to go, go and figure out the standard error first because that's the one on the bottom. We have to do some things there first, so we'll do that first. So standard error is the standard deviation of group number one divided by their sample size plus the standard deviation for group number two divided by their sample size. But remember, we have to square the standard deviation, so we're going to use variance because all this stuff is under the square root. So the standard deviation for our aroused group was 2.1. The standard deviation for our not aroused group was 1.7, and there was 30 in each of the groups. So order of operations square. So 2.1 squared is this. 1.7 squared is that. Order of operations, divide these two numbers before you add them together. These two numbers divided is 0.147. These two numbers, divide them, 0 0.0963. And then you add those two numbers together. Add those two numbers together, it's 0.2433. You take the square root of that number. So our standard error is 0.4933. So our standard error is 0.4933, and we just plug it into the bottom of the t-test formula. t-test formula is standard errors on the bottom. So we just calculated 0.4933, it's there. So now all we do is plug in the mean for aroused and the not aroused. Mean for the aroused group was 15.8. The mean for the non-aroused group is 12.1. The difference between those two groups means is 3.7. Sorry about that, 3.7. So we take that mean difference between the two groups, 3.7 divided by the standard error, 0.4933. Our T is 7.50. Again, round to the second decimal place. So it's nice if you circle it, that's fine. If you're a little bit off, let's say you got 747 or 753 or something like that, essentially if you're within a few one hundredths of a point, it's probably rounding error, and I know it's rounding error. Uh, generally, if you have more than a whole number off, an integer off, so if you're, you know, in the if you're in the sixes, if you're in the eights, I start wondering that uh, if you did it right. Um, so if you're a little bit off, don't worry. It's probably a rounding error. Uh, you or I or both. Um, but if you're off by more than one number, one whole number, even like a half of a a number, like 0.5 off, I, I start wondering if you're if you plug things in wrong or you calculated wrong. So 7.50 is the T we calculated. Now we go to step four. We make a decision about our HO. The T we calculated is 7.50.
our critical value, that line we have to cross is 1.69. We are way above that. So our calculated value of 7.50 is greater than the T from the table that gives us the critical value, the line to cross, which is 1.69. So therefore we reject the HO. There's some evidence for an effect. So our T was actually 7.5, 7 which is probably way over here somewhere. Probably very unlikely. So our T was actually way over here. We were well above this line for 1.69. So this is really unlikely. It's really unlikely to have a T that shows the difference between our mean of the arousal group versus the mean of the not arousal group to be so far so different, so big in terms of the T. So here we reject the AHO because we've crossed this line. Now we do our write-up in step number five. So the main sentence is the aroused group had higher attraction ratings compared to the not aroused group. So again, that main sentence has the two groups, aroused versus not aroused. Well, what did you compare them on? Attraction ratings. Did they differ? Yes. If they differ, you better say how they differ. So who was higher than the other? The aroused group was higher than the not aroused group on arousal, the, the uh, I'm sorry, on attraction, the DV. So state the two groups. What do you compare them on? The DV, attraction. Did they differ? Yes. If they differ, which group was higher on the DV? The aroused group was higher on attraction than the non-aroused group. Then remember in parentheses for each of our groups, we report their mean and their standard deviation in parentheses. And we do it pretty close to where they, we mentioned it. So the aroused group, we just say, oh, since we're here, we'll mention this. And then the non-aroused group, since we're here, we'll mention this. Then we have a comma, which kind of tells the reader like, Okay, we just said it in human words. If you are a stats person, read read on. If you're not, good luck to you. Um, so we say our statistic we use, it's a T. We have in parentheses degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom for our study was 58. The T we calculated is 7.50. We report that here. If we reject our, and so we have a comma, and then we say what our decision about the HO was. If we rejected the HO, there is a difference. We already said the, to the people that there is a difference between those two groups. So if we reject the HO, we say P is less than 0 0.05, which we're telling the reader is there's less than a 5% chance that I made a mistake here, a type one error. So there's less than a 5% chance that I'm telling you something exists, there's a difference between these two groups, and there really isn't one. So I'm 95% sure there's something going on. So that's it. So hopefully that that really helps to have numbers to all these formulas, I think. So this was a t-test. We actually are going to calculate two more things for these examples. We're going to do effect size, and we're going to do confidence intervals before we go. So... Just to ask you uh, what will lead to a significant value for the independent T. When it says significant value, it means you're going to reject the HO. So what's going to be the conditions that it's more likely you're going to find an effect? You're going to have a bigger T than the critical T. So look at this question, pause, and answer it. Well, the answer is there's a big mean difference. So remember the top of the T formula is the difference between the two group means. And obviously, if the top, the numerator, is larger, you have a bigger difference between the group means, you're more likely going to find a T that's significant. And then the other condition is smaller sample variances. So remember, we talked about this before. So the, the variability, the variance, standard deviation, that stuff is on the bottom of the t-test formula. That's the denominator. So the higher the denominator is, the bigger, I'm sorry, the higher the denominator is, the smaller the t-test will be. So your standard error relies a lot on your variance. So if your variance is big, your standard error is going to be big. Your t is going to be smaller. If your, uh, if your variance is smaller, your standard error is going to be smaller, your, your 
your uh, prediction is going to be better. That's going to your prediction is better. You make less errors. You're going to have a larger T. You're going to be more likely to say confidently there's a difference between the two means. So I said that we're going to calculate two more things. One is effect size and one is confidence interval. So effect size, we slightly tweak our D formula. Because remember, we have two groups. So our old effect uh, D, our Cohen's D was the difference between two means over the standard deviation. But remember, we have two standard deviations now. So the Cohen's D formula is the difference between two means. And it doesn't matter what mean one and mean two is. I'm going to use it. I'm going to stick with the first one being the uh, arousal, I'm sorry, the arousal or the uh, alcohol group, because that's the one that we thought was going to be higher. And then the second one, the second number in that formula, I'm going to have be the placebo group or the not aroused group, which is a control group. And on the bottom, we're going to take this, the variance, so the standard deviation squared for each of the two groups. We're going to add that first. We're going to take that sum, divide it by 2, and we're going to take the square root. So that's our formula for Cohen's D. I think a much easier formula is the R squared, which is telling us the percent of variance explained, which we'll talk about this specifically with numbers we'll get. So remember, R squared is T squared over T squared plus degrees of freedom. Pretty easy. Uh, I actually recommend that in some ways because I think it's an easier thing to sort of calculate. And also it has some meaning that we can uh, say specifically what's going on. But I'm going to show you both. In your homework, in your um, exams, you can do either or. So you should choose to do either a D or R squared. You don't need to do both. I'm going to show you both dish, so I'm showing you both ways of doing it. Remember, here's our little marks, and we'll use this in real life. And so here's the small, medium, and large for the Ds. This is for R squared, small, medium, and large. And we'll use this in real life. But for the R squared, uh, if it's under 0 0.01, uh, there's really no effect. So small effect is 0 0.01 to 0 0.08. Medium effect is 0.09 to 0.24, and anything that has an R square of 0.25 or above would can be considered large. So let's calculate from the examples. So you don't need to do anything new because we've already done that, but the D is the difference between the two means divided by the variance for group number one plus the variance for group number two. doesn't matter which one you put in what order because you're just adding them and divide it by two, take the square root. So remember the mean of our alcohol group, our six shots group, was 6.9. The mean of the placebo group was 6.7. And then we got, I'm sorry about this. Um, so we have uh, a standard deviation of 1.7 for the alcohol group, the six shots. We have to square that. Our standard deviation for the placebo group was 1.5. We have to square that. We'll divide that by 2, take the square root. So the above is really easy. It's 0 0.2. So if you square 1.7 and square 1.5 and you add those two numbers together, it's 5.14. You have to take 5.14 and divide it by 2 and then take the square root of it. So I kind of feel like I should show you what's going on. So 5.14 you have to divide that by 2 first. Then you take the square root. So that's 1.60. I'm fine if you round it to the second decimal place for this. Uh, that's, that's fine. You won't be off that much. So 0 0.2 divided by 1.60. So the D will be 0.13. Let's go back to that table. 0 0.13, where is that? Well, it's lower than 0.2, so I'm going to say there's no effect because we have to be at 0.2 to start saying there's a small effect. So there's no effect. R squared is just simply T squared over T squared plus DF. Remember our T was 0 0.40. I don't put the zero there. It doesn't matter mathematically, but uh, 0 0.40 was our T for that example that we calculated. Remember, that's the T we calculated. So we simply take 0.4 squared over 0.4 squared plus degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom was 38. 
So on the top we have 0.16 and on the bottom we have 38.16. So divide those two numbers and actually it comes out to zero. So go back to our table. On the bottom there it says our R-square has to be at least 0 0.01 to say it's small. So there's no effect. And actually it makes some sense. So now I can actually give you a number. What does 0 0.00 mean in terms of R-squared? It means that, in this case, 0% of the differences of the variance in the dependent variable, so 0% of the differences in our sample in attraction ratings was linked to alcohol. So alcohol no, had no effect. It didn't produce any differences in attraction ratings. So no effect for both. By the way, sometimes you get slightly different decisions here. So sometimes you might have medium and this will be large. That's okay, don't worry about that. Uh, I'd be worried if one was uh, small and the other one was large. That would be something that shouldn't happen. And actually, we would write this up in our write-up. We won't do it in this example. I think maybe I'll do it in the pair t-test because I think it'll be a little bit more efficient. But we can add a sentence. So if you did the D, you could add a sentence that uh, there was no effect, comma, D equal 0.13. Or if you did R squared, you could say that there was no effect, comma, R squared equals 0 0.00. So we can add a sentence to our write-up uh, for the effect, effect size, I should say. This example to oop. Hope you didn't see that. Uh, I think I got off it pretty quickly. If you're feeling bold, go ahead and calculate these or one of these is sufficient enough. You don't have to do both. Try to calculate one of these for the second thing we did with the arousal, not arousal, whether arousal had an effect on attraction. Go ahead and do that for the second example and I will show you the answers when you're done. Okay, so I'm gonna go on. So I only go on if you've Try to solve this yourself, at least for one of these. Again, you, you don't have to do both. You can just do one or the other. I'm going to go over both. So D. So on top, we have the difference between the two means. So this was the mean of the aroused group. This was the mean for the not aroused group. 2.1 was the standard deviation for the aroused group. 1.7 was the standard deviation for the not aroused group. You can flip them. It won't matter for mathematical reasons. I just want to be consistent. Make sure you square those standard deviations. And then after you square them, you're going to uh, add them together and you're going to divide by two. So on top, the difference between our two means was 3.7. On the bottom, if we take 2.1 squared and then we take 1.7 squared and we add those two together, we get 7.3. So if we take 7.3, and I'm going to probably have to calculate this. I want to keep that on all one line, so that's kind of why I have it like that. So if we take 7.3, divide it by 2, and then we take the square root, we get 1.91. So see right there, 1.91, and I'll expand it. So 1.91 is the denominator. And so take 3.7, divide it by 1.91, we get a D that's 1.94. Let's go back to our table. 1.94 is well above this mark, so it's going to be a large effect. We're above the 0.8 mark. And the thing about 0.8 is large, so it's a large effect. So if you did the D, you could add that sentence. You could add a sentence that says, the effect size was large, comma, D equals 1.94. Again, with all our stats, we'll round to the second decimal place for the final answer there. Okay, if you did R squared, it should look like this. So remember, R squared is T squared divided by T squared plus degrees of freedom. So remember, our T for that, that we calculated for that problem, was 7.50. So it's 7.5 squared divided by 7.5 squared plus 58. That was our degrees of freedom for that study. So 7.5 squared is 56.25. 56.25 plus 58 is 114.25. We take those two numbers and divide them. We get an R squared of 0.49.
So we could add a sentence. The effect size was large, comma, r squared equals 0.49. What does that number mean? The D is a little bit harder to interpret unless you kind of really know statistics. Well, it, it means something, but it's a little bit more complicated. R squared, it's pretty simple. What that is telling us is that 49% of the variance, so our R squared is 0.49, 49% of our variance in the attraction ratings in that study was directly linked to arousal. So whether you were aroused or not aroused. So almost half of the differences in people's attraction to somebody else was directly linked to arousal. That's a lot. I mean, if you really got this in real life, this is something that you should jump up and down about because this would be rare to have such a large percent of people's behavior explained by one factor. So that's the effect size. So I hope this kind of makes it a little bit more concrete. And then the thing that we had in last lecture that was really, really sort of tough to talk about conceptually, we're going to do now, which is confidence intervals. So conceptually, it's a little bit difficult to understand, but when we have numbers, it becomes a lot easier. And when we have actually a study to talk about, it's a lot easier. So the formula for the confidence interval is this. You're going to subtract the two means. So remember, that's the big thing. So for the t-test and for the confidence interval, the big thing is, well, what's the difference between the two means? So what's the difference between group number one minus the group number two? And then what you do is you plus and minus. There's a t. The t comes from the table. And I'm going to show you this. The t is not the one you calculate. The t is from the table. And then you multiply that t from the table with the standard error. The standard error comes from your calculations. So once you multiply these two numbers together, all you simply do take this difference, you subtract this, and you have to add this. And I know that might be a bit vague now, so let's actually look at some data in a second. I still have to show you one thing. So the T in this formula, again, and ignore the first part. The first part is just saying that we're estimating the population. So this thing doesn't really exist. We really just care about this part of the formula after the equal sign. So the T is not what you calculated. T comes from the table. Why? Because we're doing some sort of probability estimation. And so if we're doing probability estimation, we, we need to use those tables. We don't do a calculation of that. We do the tables. And the other issue I want to sort of tell you about is that the confidence interval is two-tail. So we need to use the two-tail table, uh, or at least two-tail column in this case. And what I'm going to show you is how do you get that. And I think I need my... We need, I need my Z table. I'm going to have to pause you for a second. Okay, I'm back. I'm going to show you how to do this, but I'm not going to go to the Z table. I could do it on the Z table, but it's going to be a little bit more confusing for you. I can actually show you on the T table uh, where I'm going to get this number from. But remember, we have to do a two tail because we're going in both directions because we have a plus and minus in an interval. So we have to do something slightly different. And... Uh, I want to, I'm going to have to think about whether I can actually snip this. I'm going to have to snip this and show you two different parts of it because this table is so big. But in this case, we're going to use something different for our column than what we've been using. But I actually have to expand it, so that's not really great news. Um, actually, I'm going to re-snip that because there's something nice on the bottom. I don't know if I can adjust this. I can. So sorry about this. Let me re-snip this. The column we want is there, and we're going to go all the way down to here. OK. So I can't show you everything at once. So I'm going to have to show you piece by piece. So remember with the confidence interval, because we have that plus or minus that goes up and down, we actually now are going to use two tails just for the confidence interval. And the thing is, once I give you this number, you use this number all the time. I'm just showing you where the number comes from. So um, if you want to tune out a little bit, that's fine. I'm just going to show you where the number comes from. We want to use two-tail. And we are going to use the 
alpha 0.05. Why? Because we're going to use a 95% confidence interval all the time. So 95% confidence interval translates to an alpha of 0.05. And so I have to take you down. Whoops, I don't know if I can go down after I start typing. Um, so I'm going to use this last column. So just remember that last column. And that's why I just I just showed you why right there. Let me erase all this ink. I think I cannot go down. Give me a second here. Sorry about this. I'm going to un unexpand. I think I cannot go down once I expand. But I'm going to go down first, and then I'm going to expand for you. This is a little bit annoying, but we'll live with it. And I'm going to expand this a little bit. So remember, we're in the last column. Look way down here. This is easier. You can do it from the Z. You can do it from the Z table, but it's much more difficult. So remember that we want a 95% confidence interval. We talked about that. So 95% confidence interval. Here is the number we want: 1.96. So it comes from this table. So if we're doing a two-tail test with a 0 0.05 alpha, our Z at that alpha for a two-tail test is 1.96. So this is where the number comes from. I'm not going to ask you to find this number. I am just showing you how it's done. So for all of our t-test, in terms of confidence intervals, we're going to be using this number for the T from the table is 1.96. And again, that's where that comes from. So let's go back to this. So the number in red right there is what we're going to be using, because I'm going to have you always calculate a 95% confidence interval. Why? Because we have an alpha of 0.05. It just matches. So if our alpha is 0 0.05, our confidence interval is 95%. And the T right up there, if you look in this formula, that T is from the table, it's always going to be 1.96. And we're going to do some hypothesis testing. So when we calculate our confidence interval, the rule for a hypothesis test with a confidence interval is that if our hypothesis test for, this is for t-test, if our confidence interval crosses the zero mark, we are going to fail to reject the HL. Because what that means, it means that there's a decent likelihood that zero is a possibility in terms of the difference between our two groups. So if the difference between our two groups, if it's possible that, that when a possible answer, a likely answer is zero, it means that our groups don't differ. So if our groups don't differ, we fail to reject the HL. But if our confidence interval does not contain zero, it means that zero is not a likely possibility. Zero again is that there's no difference between the two groups. So if there's no if the possibility that there's no difference between the two groups and that that number would be zero, there's no poss I should say no. There's 90 there's there's less than a 5% possibility that that would happen with our data. Then we reject the HO. So don't worry if you're not quite getting this. It's like all these things that are conceptual, they'll be clear when we have numbers. And they'll be a lot clearer. OK, so we're going to calculate the confidence intervals from the example. I'm going to do the first example, and I'm going to ask you to do the second example, but I'll run through the answer. So we're always going to be doing a 95% confidence interval. So here I, I just say simply 95 CI on the top there. So 95 CI just means it's a 95% confidence interval. And here's the, the formula. The formula is first take the difference between the two means. So this is group number one minus group number two. And then we're going to plus or minus this product, the product of the T from the table, which is always 1.96, times the standard error. Remember, we've already calculated the standard error in our t-test. So there's actually no new numbers here. We can actually just take it from our t-test. So just to remind you that for our six shots versus placebo group, the six shots mean was 
the placebo group was 6.7, so we have to take the difference between those two, because remember the t-test, we're comparing the difference between two groups. Then we're going to plus or min plus and minus the product of 1.96. Remember, 1.96 is from the table. That t, that number, 1.96, is always going to be the same for all of our t-tests. Then the standard error, I got this number from the t-test formula our t-test calculations for this problem. So the bottom part of the t-test formula was the standard error, the final answer, and I think I'll just show you. It might take a little bit of time, sorry about this. This is, yep. So remember our t, six shots versus placebo and the standard error, standard error that we calculated, which was from the previous slide, that's the calculations. But our final answer, for the standard error, the bottom part of the t-test formula is 0 0.507. So give me a second to go back to this. 0 0.507. So I just took it from there. I didn't have to recalculate anything. So our difference between our two means was 0.2. So 6.9 minus 6.7 is 0.2. Then we have to plus or minus this. So we just simply take 1.96, I don't know if I need to do this, but I'm just going to do it. 1.96 times 0 0.507, so that's what our formula says. So it's 0.99. Just for confidence intervals, we can round this to the second decimal place because the final answer will be in the second decimal place. So 0.99. So 1.96 times 50, uh, 0.507 is 0.99. So I'm, I think I have to show you again. Sorry about this. So the first thing I always do is I want to find the lowest part of the confidence interval. So the lowest part is we subtract. So we have 0.2 minus 0.99. So the lowest part is point, I'm sorry, negative 0.79. So you notice here, I've actually made brackets because in brackets it shows me it's an interval. So I have negative 0.79. So again, that was 0.2 minus 0.99. I always like to do the lowest first, just because I'm writing that first. Then you want to do the highest part of the interval. So you're going to take 0.2 plus 0.99. And so when we add those two numbers together, it's 1.19. So remember, we have to do both. It says, it says plus or minus on our interval. So 0.2 minus 0.99, it's negative 0 0.79. 0 0.2 plus 0.99, 1.19. So I've actually drawn that. I've drawn our interval. So we have negative 79 on the bottom part, and we have 1.19 on the upper part. I've drawn zero in here. So zero is in between, right? We have a negative number. We have a positive number. So zero somewhere here. You don't have to be fully accurate where it is, it's, it's there. Our interval, this, these two numbers, they cross zero. What does crossing zero mean? Crossing zero means that there is a fairly high likelihood that zero is a possibility for our interval. The interval is this, the difference between the two means. If the difference between our two means is zero, it means that these are equal. So if there's a mean of 9 here and a mean of 9 here, it's a 0. The difference is 0. So if we have a difference that's 0, it means that there's no difference between our two groups. It means that the IV had no effect. So if our interval crosses 0, it means that it's very possible that the actual difference between our two groups is 0. If that's the case, then we fail to reject the HO. There's no effect. We don't have any evidence of an effect. So that's how we can do a hypothesis test with confidence interval. So go ahead and do the second example. Do the arousal, not arousal example. Calculate the confidence interval. It's a 95% confidence interval. We won't change that. So calculate that. And in the end, do a hypothesis test with the numbers you get. So go ahead and do it. Pause right now, and I'll show you the answers in a bit. So you should have done this already for the second example. I'm going to go to the next slide. I'm going to show you the answer. Same formula. We're going to take the difference between the two means, the difference between the aroused group mean, not aroused group mean. 
we're going to plus and minus the product of the t from the table from the uh, times the standard error, which came from our t-test calculations from before. So remember the mean of the aroused group was 15.8. The mean for not aroused was 12.1. And then we're going to plus or minus the t from the table, which was 1.96. And then we're going to do the standard error. The standard error came from the calculation of our t before. This was the bottom part of our t. 0.4933. So the difference between our two means was 3.7, and then we have to plus or minus 0 0.97. Again, 0 0.97 is from multiplying 1.96. We're always going to have that. That's our t. Doesn't change for our t test for confidence intervals. Times the standard error. And remember to round up to the second decimal place because we're reporting our confidence intervals in terms of two decimal places. So it's 0.97. So we have 0.97 here. So we have to do th two things. We have to subtract these numbers. We have to add these numbers. I like to subtract first. It gives me the lowest number. The lowest number is 3.7. That's our difference between the two means. Subtract the 0.97. So our lowest number is 2.73. So again, I made the brackets to kind of show it's an interval. 2.73 is the lowest number, so when I take 3.7 3 minus 0.97, that's the number. Then we also have to add. So the difference between the two means is 3.7. Then we can add 0.97. The upper, upper part of our interval is 4.67. So our interval is, our confidence interval is 2.73 to 4.67. That's how you write it. You put brackets around it, and you have a little comma between the two numbers. And then I've drawn it in terms of our hypothesis test. And by the way, I'll, I'm going to talk about the hypothesis test first in a, in, a, in a little bit. You can actually report this too. So you could have another sentence. So you can add another sentence after your effect size. You could say that the 95% CI, you could say, say 95 CI, that would be fine with me. The 95 CI was bracket. 2.73 comma 4.67 end of brackets period so you can just have a simple sentence reporting the confidence interval in our write-up okay let's get to the hypothesis test so i drew so our lower point is 2.73 our upper point is 4.67 so that's our confidence interval right there in a photo where's the zero well the zero is over here did we cross the zero no we did not so we did not cross zero. What does that mean? It means that at least 95% sure that zero is not a possibility for the difference between our two means. The difference between the mean for the arousal and not arousal, zero is not really likely. It's not a likely possibility. So if zero is not a likely possibility, it means that there's a difference. So if there's a difference, we reject the HO. So if your confidence interval does not cross the zero, you reject HO because it means that zero is not likely. Zero means there's no difference, so it means that a difference is likely. So we reject the HO. And you just notice that we make the same decision. Our confidence interval hypothesis test was exactly the same decision about the HO as our t-test that we did before. Okay, we're pretty much done. I'm just going to run through the last slides, which are the assumptions, which we talked about before. So the, the observations within each sample must be independent. That, that basically means that, again, your research design is good. Uh, so your aroused group and your not aroused group, they weren't treated any differently, except that the IV differed. One was not aroused, one was aroused. That's the only thing that could affect the DV. So it just means that there's nothing else affecting the DV except for the IV at least in terms of our statistical test. Two populations from the samples are, uh, from which the samples are selected must be normal. So look, notice that the samples don't have to be normal. In terms of distribution, the assumption is that the population is normal. And guess what? There's ways that we can't really test that actually, because we don't know what the population is. We just kind of assume it. Then the final assumption that we're going to talk about here, at least on this slide, is the homogeneity of variance. It just means that the variance for the two groups are the, roughly the same. 
So the variance and attraction ratings is roughly the same for the success group versus the placebo group. And I think they were relatively close. And then the same thing for the second experiment. So the variance in attraction ratings for the aroused group should be roughly around the same as the not aroused group. However, do remember that this homogeneity of variance is pretty robust. You have to have like four times a difference to actually affect your, your t-test decisions. Um, so homogeneity of variance is important. Uh, we aren't going to test that by hand, but there's ways that SPSS test that, which you are going to do for our lab in a bit. Actually, I think I'd have you ignore it in the lab. So this just tells whether it's robust or not. I think I've talked about this a little bit. Um, the independent samples, which is that first one, is important. That's, that, in some ways, both a method and a stats thing. So you don't want other variables affecting the DV, because if it does, especially if it's a compound, it's going to throw off your study. It's not a very good study. And then two, um, your statistics are going to be wrong, because there's something else sneaking around, changing the variance in the dependent variable. That's not your IV. So you're going to make a wrong decision about your IV based on your stats. Uh, normality and homogeneity of variance, it's, pretty, it's very robust. Um, and then for normality, it's really robust. If you have uh, each group, you have a sample size of 40 and they're roughly equal, it's really robust. But the truth is even with sample sizes for your two groups of 15, it's still gonna be pretty robust. So normality is something that we talk about, but most of our stats are pretty robust in protecting against that violation. If you're not quite getting these assumptions, don't worry. Um, I don't go a lot about this in tests and things like that, but you're supposed to know this stuff. So I'm talking about it, but if you're feeling a little bit lost about this, that's fine. It's much better if you get the hands-on stuff about how to calculate the T, how to test the null hypothesis, how to write up the findings, how to do an effect size calculation, how to calculate the confidence interval, and how to make a judgment about the hypothesis test of a null hypothesis test for this, the confidence interval. That stuff's the more important. And homogeneity of variance is it's very robust also. They're more formal tests. You can see the book if you're really curious about them, but um, we have to talk about them just to let you know about them. But again, the important stuff is what I just talked about in terms of the hands-on stuff. So for this topic of independent t-tests, there is actually a homework and a lab. Uh, so there is a little bit of work related to the independent t-test. And so there will be a video about the lab that will explain SPSS and how to interpret the SPSS output. The homework is basically going to be like what we did in lecture in terms of calculating things and writing up your findings. And that's it for this lecture. And the next lecture, we'll talk about the paired t-test, which is just similar to what we talked about. It's just a different design where we have within subjects design, where, for example, you might arouse somebody and see their attraction to somebody, and then you have them be in a not aroused group and see their attraction to somebody. So within each person, do their attraction ratings vary when they're aroused versus not aroused? That's called a paired t-test. And some good news about that, I think that's a lot easier topic. So we've learned some of the tough stuff. So the paired t-test is usually a lot easier to learn. And I think the calculations are a bit easier in some ways. Um, but you'll see if you agree with me or not. Um, but I think conceptually it's a lot easier. So we'll have a pretty um, nice slide into the next exam with the paired t-test, which we'll cover next. So I will talk to you then.